Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today. And wait, wait, more Xbox news? Is this a sign that things are finally heating up? Not really. This is actually, this, none of this is good news, honestly. I, I, I just, I gotta give it to you straightforward here. So I hope you're having a fantastic day because right now, this, this news update, it may be a smidge of a Debbie Downer. We got some drama going on in gaming. We don't like drama here, but at the end of the day, there's stuff happening in the Xbox realm, especially with one of their first party studios. And it was a story that caught me off guard, but I really wanted to dive into it. We're also getting into a new update on Activision and the lawsuit that was hitting them. And last but certainly not least, Xbox made a really dumb change to clip sharing, which they are looking to revert now. So we're gonna talk about all that in today's news update. If you're new here, consider subscribing as we're gonna be talking about Xbox whenever they decide to do stuff beyond the, the whole Activision announcement where, you know, that was like the only major thing outside of Game Pass they've done this year. Hopefully, heading into the summer, we will have more from them. But for now, things are kind of quiet. With that, let's get into easily our number one story of the day, which is what's going on with Undead Labs. So for those who are unfamiliar with Undead Labs, they're the developers of State of Decay. And I remember discovering State of Decay on the Xbox Live Summer Arcade and being completely enamored by this title, right? The survival aspects, rummaging through different houses, collecting supplies, and the risk reward of that character you're building up, if they die, they're permanently dead. It's not just a loot game, it's also that connection to this character comes in a different form, the gameplay instead of the story. And so now the former founder of Undead Labs, Jeff Strain, senses a bit of a hit piece coming out and in a rare moment in gaming, instead of watching it all happen and responding to it, he actually got ahead of the curve and posted his own article on the medium to explain himself and to show the very questions that Kotaku asked him and went, here were my answers because he felt that this piece would be very critical of him. So let's go through it. It is not the entire write-up. While I did read all of it, I picked out a lot of the highlights there. I do recommend you check it out for yourself. With that, it starts off with a tweet saying, Kotaku is publishing an article on Undead Labs today. Here are my thoughts. When going to that article, it starts off saying, today Kotaku will be running an article about Undead Labs, one of the four studios I have founded in my career. It's been about two and a half years since I was leading Undead, but two days ago, Kotaku sent me a list of questions and gave me a short time to respond to them. The tone of the article is clearly going to be critical of me, Personally, I stand by my leadership at the lab as I stand by my leadership as a co-founder of ArenaNet and founder of my new studios. Both ArenaNet and Undead Labs were grueling, thrilling, draining, and exhilarating experiences where I learned in real time, made mistakes, matured, made more mistakes, and hopefully a few smart decisions and matured some more. At both of these early career studios, through the startup days to acquisition and growth into a larger company, I was always trying to learn how to do things better every single day. At both ArenaNet and at Undead Labs, in a very complex and troubled industry, I tried very hard to reduce and then eliminate crunch, offer generous vacation and paid time off benefits, pay well, extend strongly supportive parental leave, provide a world-class healthcare, and go to great lengths to care for my colleagues and create a positive environment for everyone. None of these efforts were perfect, but these issues remain high, meaningful priorities for me, including my current studios. Yeah, so let's pause right there before we get into the whole Q&A stuff. Uh, this is unfortunately the, the day and age we live in where even if what they're about to say about Jeff is pretty damning, we do live in a day and age where leaders can't learn. If you don't get it perfectly the first time, and a company has disgruntled employees, which uh, newsflash, literally every company has that. A lot of these journalists will take those disgruntled employees, whether they be two or 20, and run a story through them to try to expose a company because that's the day and age we live in, where it's not like, hey, we have 98 happy employees and two who are upset and they'll run the story about the two who are upset. Not saying that is exactly the case here, but it's something I've felt pretty passionate about is that part of being a leader is being humble, making those mistakes, learning from those mistakes and doing better the second time. Obviously there are certain mistakes that just shouldn't be made, but if you're actively trying to push your studio in a progressive direction and you do make mistakes, I don't think in general hit pieces should be made about you if you're trying to lead your team in the right way. It's not always gonna be ideal, especially in the video games industry, but 
Let's get into the meat and potatoes of this conversation. The questions Kotaku asked. Again, like I said earlier, there is more here, more questions that he was answering, but some of these answers do provide insight to State of Decay 3. They do provide insight to things like the happenings over at Undead Labs, and you can sort of see the angle Kotaku is taking with this. So it begins with this question. What did you envision for State of Decay 3 and how do you feel development was going up until you left Undead Labs? He says, I envisioned that State of Decay 3 would be the ultimate fulfillment of the survival fantasy we pioneered with State of Decay in 2013. State of Decay fans have always been vocal about what they want to see and there's a surprising amount of consistency to it. It's a game of interacting simulated systems, and the deeper the simulation, the richer the emergent mechanics and sense of agency. The real point of the question though is, how did you feel development was going up until you left Undead Labs? Well, like many projects making the difficult transition to AAA, there were tons of unknowns and worse, unknown unknowns. I got to work on State of Decay 3 when it was easy, what I call the, you know what would be cool phase of development. The hard work of turning, you know what would be cool into an actual game happened after I left. Next, he writes, Some staff say you gave a speech on the studio's floor shortly before the 2018 acquisition that Undead would always stay independent and question if that was just a negotiating tactic to get a better deal from Microsoft. How did those acquisitions talks start and what changed your mind? He goes, first of all, dramatically announcing things to studio employees is not an effective business negotiation tool, so no on that. There were several strong acquisition offers during my 10 year tenure at Undead Labs and we had visitors in the studio doing due diligence at various points. I never hid those meetings and actively involved studio leads as part of those discussions. My wife and I declined all offers until the offer from Microsoft. I don't recall the speech, but I'd be very surprised if I promised we'd always stay independent as we'd been openly fielding acquisition offers for years. It was clear in 2018 that Undead Labs was going to focus on the State of Decay IP and the expectations and initial budget for State of Decay 3 were way higher than anything we'd done before. When you own an independent studio, you are personally responsible for it. If you fail a milestone and don't get paid, you have to cover the payroll personally. And State of Decay 3 was going to be way beyond anything we'd personally back financially. We needed to protect the jobs, benefits, and work culture we'd built up over the eight last years, and so we were receptive to acquisition discussions with Microsoft. So yeah, a little bit of information on how Microsoft has protected some of these studios. A lot of people call it hearsay, that it's just, oh, assumed like you got a big company like Microsoft, everyone's safe, but you're seeing here the game changer that State of Decay 3's developer, Undead Labs, had a ton of acquisition offers on the table. It's never specified who. I think Microsoft definitely be the most interesting one because you know the amount of money that they do have, but the ability to go from when you look at State of Decay 2, which is a solid game, but definitely looks like it's on a tight budget, to now triple A development with State of Decay 3, that has me excited because again, this is a company that worked really well within a tight budget and created some unique mechanics that enhanced the post-apocalyptic genre in my eyes. And then you look at them moving into triple A, it's like, okay, what do you got now? That's what's exciting about Xbox's future. But again, it does put a bit of a spotlight while it's off topic on what Xbox is able to do for some of these companies with their acquisitions. Let's continue reading because there is much more. Who got payouts from the sale? Some employees speculated it was only you. Were there bonuses of any kind paid out to those who didn't have equity? As my wife and I never took any external investment or loans to fund the lab, we held 100% ownership in the studio, but we distributed 20% of the sale to key early employees. One has now started their own studio, and several of them are working with me at my new studios. Just as Undead Labs was initially funded with the acquisition proceeds from ArenaNet, the proceeds from the sale of Undead Labs have funded our current studios and the jobs that they have produced. Also, were there special clauses in the limited integration contract that prevented Microsoft from doing oversight of the studio or directly firing, hiring, laying off staff? Was that agreement substantially different from the ones that it had, had with other recently acquired studios? Not to my knowledge, although Microsoft is very protective of studio self-direction, and they certainly never hired, fired, laid off anyone while I was there. I don't have any knowledge of the other studio's contract. Let's pause there again. This has been very illuminating, of course, on the direction of Undead Labs, but really the fact that I mean, we have Microsoft coming in and saying, we're not gonna change really anything with you when they give them boatloads of cash, when they 
probably have the right to. I just think it's a, a really strangely good look for Microsoft in this way. Now, granted, we just talked a couple weeks ago about what's going on with the initiative and how sometimes Microsoft's hands-off approach could be bad for certain studios that are spiraling a bit. But Undead Labs, before the Kotaku article hits, seemed like a pretty well-run studio. Seemed like it had its head on straight. So let's keep going. There's a little bit more to this story, and then we'll move on to the next one. How would you describe your time at Undead between the acquisition and leaving? Some employees said you were already remote most of the time and checked out day to day. A few referred to you as an absentee father. Compared to the first six years at the studio, I can understand how some people could see it that way. I poured my heart and soul into Undead Labs. It was extremely hard work getting it off the ground. I gave it everything I had financially, emotionally, mentally, and physically to get State of Decay out the door. State of Decay 2 underway and the studio on a growth trajectory. By 2015, it became clear I had to strike a more balanced relationship with work and bring on a few people to help me run the company. In 2016, I started the weekly travel to join my wife and five children in New Orleans. So yeah, compared to my previous level of engagement, it might have appeared I was checked out, but I had to have some help. I just couldn't do it on my own any longer. After that, the article does get into things like Philip Holt, as well as Ann Schlosser. These are hires in particular that Kotaku was poking around about, knowing if he was involved with any of those hirings or if he knew them personally. With leadership nowadays, it's tough for them to learn on the fly, you know, especially when you're starting up. I, I can relate to that personally. When you're starting up, there's a lot of lessons you have to learn. If, I, I think it commands a level of respect personally because it's not easy. It's why the job's not for everybody. And it's about how you adapt to it as you learn more that really, I think, does define those leaders. And of course, as we're editing this video, the article from Kotaku has dropped, so I thought it would be fair to stitch this in, get both sides of the story as expected. So let's begin by diving into the major beats and then we'll discuss a little bit. Undead Labs has doubled in size but lost its charismatic founder, that being Jeff Strain. It's working on the ambitious sequel, State of Decay 3, but after several years, it is still trapped in pre-production, which as an Xbox fan is disappointing to hear because there's many games in the pipeline that we're all waiting for and recently it's faced allegations of mismanagement, burnout, and misogyny as it struggled to live up to the promise of being the welcoming, diverse, and inclusive Xbox first-party studio it touts itself as. Now here's where I think things get a bit interesting and I do have some thoughts. Kotaku interviewed 12 current and former employees for this article, all of whom requested to be anonymous because they fear that sharing their concerns publicly would doom their careers in the video game industry. Many felt very positive about certain aspects of the studio. A few said it still has room to improve, but has overall been a very good place to work. Most considered the last few years since the acquisition a period of crisis and are worried management hasn't learned the right lessons. Now look, these stories should always be heard. I'm all about giving voices to the voiceless, if you will. But if you take a quick look at something like LinkedIn, where I know that not every single employee at a company is listed and that these lists are typically updated frequently, Undead Labs currently has 111 employees, according to LinkedIn. And when you look at that perspective there of 12 employees, many of them being former, and then the 111 who currently work there, I'm not saying that everyone's having a really good time, but but I do think we have to consider the perspective of the story that we do have many articles about studio culture being pushed by a very distinct minority. And again, they may be speaking on the behalf of others, I'm not 100% sure, but this is just something worth considering on a general level before we continue going forward. I've been critical of articles, say from Jason Trier, where we hear about four developers who were disgruntled in a studio of like 80. And I think to myself, well, it's worth hearing these four, but at the same time, they speak for the other 80. So with that, let's keep reading. At first, some employees were worried that Microsoft's acquisition would change the indie studio for the worse. Now they worry that the $2 trillion company is incredibly hands off and allow dysfunction to fester, leaving some of the studio's more vulnerable employees to fend for themselves. As one former developer put it, we were afraid they would come in and change our culture, but our collapse from within, and we could have used Microsoft's help. Every studio at Xbox is given the resources and guidance they need to grow in both capability and culture. This comes from the actual statement submitted by Microsoft's PR department. 
What that support looks like will vary by studio, but each has a direct connection with Microsoft HR resources outside of what they have on their team and the ability to work with other studios and partner teams to leverage their expertise. Additionally, all Microsoft employees, including our studio teams, are required to regularly complete our standards of business conduct training, which cover topics like harassment, supplier code of conduct, and more. Over the last few years, Undead Labs has seen a number of positive changes, and we are confident in the direction the team is taking State of Decay 3, one of our most ambitious open world games in development. Which again, if you read the article, it does say that, that many people are happy with where things are heading. Some are worried, but many people are happy about that. Now there are mentioning of if you are a white male that you typically were favored in this studio. And they said that when I was interviewed at the lab, I was sold on the idea of a studio in transition that was making diversity, equity, and inclusion a top priority. What it was in actuality was studio leadership painting a DIE face for Microsoft while women were consistently ignored, dismissed, interrupted, talked over, and blamed. Women's opinions would be outright rejected even for extremely basic code or games knowledge, said another. No one would listen to them. Even women in director level positions were outright ignored, talked over, and blamed for problems. One former developer recalled men asking women to take notes during meetings, ignoring their expertise, and even making sexist remarks like, you don't look as pretty as normal today and i'm surprised a girl like you has this job yeah definitely not something that should be said i think even in jest in today's culture no matter how close you are with someone it just doesn't sound right especially in a working environment so yeah there are certainly problems here these are things that shouldn't be said these are things that need to be fixed and i do think that there's a consistency here when you look at what's happened with the initiative when you look at what's happened now with undead labs microsoft has been hands off on a creative level and i think that's fine but i do think now when you have activision how can you expect to write that ship when you have have two other studios here that have been in your family for a while struggling internally with direction. I do think there could be a call to arms here that they need to be more hands-on with how they handle people, right? It's different from the creative process. Let them make what they want, give them the money to make what they want. But on a people level, there needs to be some type of enforcement here to make sure that there is proper treatment. So all in all, a good write-up here. Not much negative said about Jeff Strain, more about the general studio culture here, but they do talk about the things that Jeff mentioned in his own write-up about being the absentee father, how he was gone for a while. And I think that Jeff, in fairness now, with both these sides of the story, did a good job getting ahead of things because it could have muddied his reputation when a lot of what was said here really wasn't negative at all. Let's move on to our next story. Again, more, more drama. I'm sorry, I'm very, very sorry. But this one has to do with Activision. So as many of you know, they were hit with a lawsuit last year due to a lot of sexual harassment allegations amongst many other things. And now it appears that there is a settlement that has been reached for $18 million. This article comes from PC Gamer where they write, a US judge has approved Activision Blizzard's $18 million settlement with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission wrapping up one of the many discrimination lawsuits brought against the company. The lawsuit had outlined details of sexual harassment, sex discrimination relating to its handling of pregnancy and retaliation against its female employees. The settlement was originally agreed upon in September 2021, but was put on hold after objections from the Department for Employment and Housing the following month. The two agencies have been scrapping with each other throughout, with each having its own individual lawsuit. While the DFEH argued that the EEOC settlement would cause irreparable harm to its own suit, the EEOC then fired back by claiming that the DFEH had two lawyers that were operating under ethical violations. Former Blizzard employee Jessica Gonzalez was also denied a motion to intervene in the proposed settlement. Despite concerns that the EEOC settlement would undermine the DFEH's own pursuit, District Judge Dale Fisher has approved the settlement. The court filing from Tuesday's hearing states the court is generally satisfied that both the monetary relief and the non-monetary provisions are fair, reasonable, and adequate. The $18 million settlement will be put towards harassment and discrimination prevention programs at Activision Blizzard with oversight from the EEOC. The remaining funds will be donated to select charities by the EEOC, focusing on those related to women in the games industry and those tackling gender equality issues. It marks the second largest sexual harassment settlement for the EEOC, but the Labor Union Communications Workers of America called the sum woefully inadequate last year. You know what's actually kind of funny about this, and I don't want to sound morbid when I say, hey, this is funny, but what's interesting would probably be the better word, 
is there's more, right? This is one of multiple lawsuits and it's $18 million. It's crazy to think just how much of a tangled web Activision has woven for themselves. And now Microsoft absolutely has a lot of cleanup work here and they're gonna be inheriting some of these suits. I actually was fortunate enough to have a great chat with Hogue Law, as many of you are familiar with Hogue, who's been on this channel here before to talk about the legality of the video games industry. And yeah, this is gonna be a lot of Microsoft's dirty laundry to clean up in due time. And some of their money they're gonna have to spend. It's why right now they're looking at June, 2023 as the likely date, that's the date with the cushion, right? For when the deal with Activision and Xbox will go through. Cause there's a lot of legal cleanup to do amongst all of this. It's why a lot of people are kind of uneasy because anytime you see Activision's name popping up lately, it's like, oh my God, another legal thing for them, another battle for them. Is this gonna go through? So far, the gauge I got from my good friend Ho was uh, no, it doesn't look like any of this will have an impact. And in fact, that it's settling for those who are just worried about the games does mean meaningful progress in some way, shape or form. But these are largely separate from what's going on with the acquisition talks, but still an important update nonetheless, because justice is being handled here. And that's very important because Activision was terrible, man. Like there was physical evidence of just how bad this place was to work at. And that's why they came as such a stunner to being acquired. But with that, let's move on to our final story here. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, Xbox, for some reason, said, let's add an extra step to how you post clips onto Twitter, where PlayStation really gets the idea, huh, social media is like the thing right now. Everyone's addicted to it. Let's put a share button on our controller that literally links to your Twitter account, to your Facebook account, to your Instagram account, and just whoop, up the picture goes, up the screenshot, the video, whatever, up it goes, just like that, and a couple of clicks, it's all well integrated. Xbox had this, clip sharing thing and then they decided to make it where it goes through your phone you'll read about it in just a moment here but it was just a dumb choice fortunately they are reversing it so this article comes from video game chronicle where it's titled xbox reverses its decision to remove sharing game clips directly to twitter an xbox insider build rolled out to members earlier this month removed twitter sharing entirely from the xbox dashboard the removal of the feature meant users had to upload clips to their phones and then share them from there adding a second stage to the process thanks to your feedback on the twitter share feature change we flighted in build 20 204 that change is being reverted to the previous behavior from today in this new build xbox insider program lead brad rossetti said on wednesday uh, this is one of those stories where i just want to give everyone the update but i can't help but read it and go like well, like how did this get through in the first place that's what i look at and think i'm like why was this ever a thought a flip of the switch clearly it was a flip of the switch because they're turning it on so quickly again why this was ever a thing i don't know this is such a dumb choice and i hate to go hard on them here but this is something that xbox cannot falter in their clip sharing their clip editing is already terrible and the fact that their program actually went in reverse and removed a key feature and thought that would be something people would be cool with blows my mind Take a real serious look at that program, Xbox. I'm just saying. But fortunately, it's going back to how it should be. I'm glad they're listening to feedback. That's great. With that, ladies and gentlemen, that's all of the Xbox news I got for you in today's video. Not a positive one, but definitely an enlightening one for damn sure. So what do you think of what's going on with Undead Labs, Activision, and of course the clip sharing with Xbox? Fire away. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the hell out of the content here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.